everybody. Welcome to another episode of Cyber Starters. If you're looking for a highly engaging and relevant discussion focused on cybersecurity entrepreneurship, covering topics from how to start a business to challenges entrepreneurs encounter to strategies for effective problem solving, then you are in luck because that's exactly what we're doing here. Alongside my co-host, Ryan Larovic, CEO over at Nuvic, we are going to be tearing into how to fund your startup. This is the episode that you're going to learn. Yes, you want to do the you want to do the startup, whatever it is, product, service, but you need the money and the capital in order to launch that vision. How do you fund that startup? Quick shout out to ACI Learning, the exclusive sponsor of season one of Cyber Starters. Ryan, you know, you and I have two different kind of backgrounds and upbringings as far as how we got to where we were with our own businesses. What is your approach for funding your startup? Any, 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 like you know, you know, gems or any like troubles that you encountered on your uh, journey that would have been nice to have this conversation beforehand? Yeah, fund it appropriately. I mean, that's why t- today's discussion with Ali is going to be great because we bootstrapped ours uh, and it worked out okay. But not everybody can do that. And but if you need to build out something, you know, of that takes a lot of uh, resources, you're going to need to fund it quickly, right? So I'm looking forward to hearing what she has to say. Yeah, a hundred percent. So stay tuned because we're going to be talking to Allie about how to fund your startup, things that you need to think about when it comes to funding. When do you go to funding? Then you got marketing. Do you invest in ads or communications? And then the ever present question that a lot of people don't really give consideration to is leadership versus operation. When do you hire people? And unfortunately, you know, when do you have to let people go? All of this and more, we're going to be talking with our guest, Alyssa Knight, today. Alyssa Knight is a business magnet, American author, screenwriter, film director, and producer. And in 2020, Alyssa formed Knight Group, which today controls five companies in publishing, marketing, events, and film production. And on top of all that, Alyssa, aka Allie, is a wonderful human being, and I am super pumped to be bringing her onto the show today. Let's go get Allie. Let's do it. Hey, Allie, how are you? Hey, hey, Jerry. Hey, Ryan. It's good to see you. Hey, I Allie. Have, like one of the highest production values on on in cyber on on the web. I, I love all the production value on your show. It's oh great. my god! Well, thank you. That, I mean, that is that is a very flattering. <laughs> it's a very flattering comment, and coming from someone who, if you just heard me read Alyssa's bio, uh, knows a thing or two about a thing or two when it comes to. <laughs> Uh, production. So thank you very much, uh, Ali. Uh, so great to have you on the show. We're talking about how to fund your startup. So this whole season, we've been covering specific topics. And we had Grace Chi from Pulse Dive on recently for episode four, talking about do you bootstrap or do you VC fund? You know, so if, if you're interested in this episode, I recommend you go watch that one first, because I feel like that's step one. And what we're going to be digging into is step too. So uh, Alyssa, just to kind of dive right into the into the deep end here, like how should we even be thinking about funding? Let's like baseline and, de- and, and like define what we're doing here. Like how should we think about funding? Right. Yeah. So um, thanks, Jerry. Appreciate it. Uh, there, this is, we could probably do an entire show on this, but um, for those of you who don't know, I sit on uh, several boards for uh, several venture capital funds. One of them is the Night Dragon uh, Venture Capital Fund, um, and uh, it's worked with several of its sister funds as well uh, as an advisor. And so uh, in addition to starting multiple companies and selling them on the sell side of M&A or mergers and acquisitions, um, I have actually bootstrapped every single one of my companies as well. Um, but I do have obviously a lot of sell side and buy side M&A work. I've started and sold multiple cybersecurity startups. And one of the things that I don't really talk about is within Knight Group, I know you mentioned the different verticals that we have, we own companies in. One, we actually do have an MSSP that we own as well called Briar and Thorn. Um, so in addition to the other areas of Knight Group, we also own a managed security services provider. Um, so I, I think I can provide a lot of value in this conversation. In fact, that one of the first things that you need to think about as an entrepreneur is whether or not, and you brought this up earlier, but whether or not you even seek venture capital funding. One of the biggest mistakes that I've seen entrepreneurs make is they'll have a services business and, and they'll spend 
six to eight months um, you know, trying to raise money from VC firms. And one of the biggest mistakes I've seen made is thinking that you can raise money from venture capitalists for a services company. I can tell you unequivocally that venture capitalists tend to stay away from services businesses. It's, 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 you know, it's, it's linear growth. If you compare it to a product company where there's intellectual property, there's potential for patents, ultimately as a startup, you need to first determine, okay, if I'm a services business, is there any intellectual property that I can create? Is there a software-based platform? Is there, an app? is there something that I can add to the company for intellectual property that would make it a viable investment for VCs? Uh, VCs do not like services businesses uh, because if you think about it, in order to grow the company, in order to scale the company, you have to hire, right? The more contracts that you bring in, the more your SGNA is going to increase the more that you're going to have to hire and pay out salaries it's just a very linear based growth whereas you know if it's a products company uh, that's something that vcs will tend to invest in now once you've made the determination that you are the you know a great business for raising venture capital i've seen some entrepreneurs make the mistake of going to private equity funds or pe funds you need to understand that there's different types of capital outside capital that you can raise there's early stage, like seed stage, right? So that's your seed round. And that's typically going to be between, you know, anywhere from 250,000 all the way up to a million. I've seen it a little bit north of a million for a seed round, but that's rare. Um, but there's the seed round. And then you've got your later stages like A, B, C. And then those are the different types of VC funds that you can approach. So for example, Night Dragon is a later stage fund, right? Um, they tend not to invest in early stage seed stage companies. Uh, versus the other VC funds. So look at the the investment criteria for the VC firms. So I'll meet entrepreneurs that will just hammer out their business plan to every VC email address they can find. And they don't actually look on the website to see what their investment criteria is. So it's a big waste of time and effort. Um, once uh, you do that, you can move into later stage. And then that's when you're talking to like PE funds or private equity funds, which are much later stage. So I, I know I think I over answered that question or over engineered that question, but it's good. Yeah, it's good. I mean, it actually uh, gives me thought for another question. So, you know, a, a lot of times businesses can separate the products and services, but a lot of times on the early part of the product, the services pay the bill until you can get the product up and running. Right. And, yeah. I mean, would you recommend two businesses then, like, so you can carve it off? Yeah, that's and that's okay too. Like for example, you know, with Brian Thorn, we started out purely as a consulting firm. Then we turned it into a managed security service provider, built a security operations center, and then we built a software platform uh, called Red Inc which basically you know, became the flagship product or way to be able to integrate with different APIs for our customers and the different monitoring solutions that they were using. So you can definitely start out as a services business. That's a great way to bring in revenue. So you know, a lot of people think, hey, look, uh, I want to start a business. I need to quit my job and I need to go get funding. No, no, no. It, yeah it's okay to burn the candle at both ends of the, the stick. It's okay to burn that midnight oil. You can you know, work for a company full time and build your startup on the side. And as your revenues come in and your revenues get to a point where you can actually sustain a salary, pay your mortgage, keep the lights on and not have to really stress about that, then you can leave your company and then focus full time on their startup. I, I, I think a lot of people have that you know, just misunderstanding, misperception that I need to quit my job in order to pursue my startup. And it's just not, it's not the case. Yeah. In fact, oh, it actually almost demonstrates a, an understanding of cost control that way, right? So you don't right. immediately jump into one. But and, and, I, yeah. Uh, oops, sorry. Go ahead, Ryan. No, no, no keep going. No, I was just going to say, and the other thing is, I don't want all of you to think I'm throwing shade on you if you're a services business. Uh, uh, out of the two companies that I've sold, you know, one of them was a services business. The other one was a product company. And now this third one I'm in the process of selling uh, is a, a services business. So, you know, I mean, I'm not throwing shade on services companies. All I'm saying is that if you decide that you need to bring in venture capital because you want to have a bazillion employees and, you know, drive around in a Lamborghini, 
Um, you know, it's 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 you can start out as a services company, and then once you bring it, have enough money to hire a developer or hire someone off of Fiverr to build something for you, whatever it may be. Because remember, you don't have to hire a full-time developer. You can go to Fiverr, you can go to Upwork, and you can just hire someone uh, in another country at you know quarter of the price and get a product made, and then go out and pursue funding. But you know, don't don't start out with that services business and immediately think that Sequoia Capital is going to want to throw money. At you. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> but what's great there is like, and I think you teased it out right in the beginning, which is like investors look for returns. Yeah, exactly. If, 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 Right. So if you're going to build it out low and slow right over time, then maybe that doesn't fit the timetable or the return. Exactly. Right. And typically services businesses typically don't fall into that category where like, you know, a big application or a product company might. Right. Because then you can see the scale quickly, low, you know, lower investment uh, of a certain capital that hits the market just right. And now you get the multiple that they're looking for. And I think what I loved about what you were saying is like, consider that when you're going for money. Because two yeah. things are going to get wasted. Like one, as you're going, if if you realize you're not going to provide the return they're looking for, well, then you're kind of waste. You're not wasting everybody's time because you always learn something. But you're probably not going to get what you're looking for, especially if you're in a services business, right? Yeah. So yeah. And the other side of that is like if you do have a significant amount, of, significant significant understanding of what the multiple might look like for them, well, then you got a better shot at getting funding. Right. But you have to be able to communicate that. So that was kind of the message I was taking from what you're saying. I loved it because that could save a lot of people a lot of time. Exactly. And, you know, when you're negotiating and I'm sure we're going to cover this, but when you're negotiating the VC deal, one of the biggest things you're going to want to look for are things like ratchet clauses, meaning that typically they'll have revenue milestones. And then in order to get that next tranche of funding um, and that, let's say, for example, you've just raised 40 million from a VC, they're not going to give you all 40 million dollars, put it in your bank account and trust you. that. You're <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't work that way. Um, you're going to get them in tranches and there's going to be what are called ratchet clauses. Um, but you're going to want to make sure that you understand what those ratchet clauses are, meaning that they can actually, if you're not hitting your milestones, they have the ability to actually take more control of your company based on whether or not you're hitting those those you know key performance indicators um, and being able to get that next tranche of money. The other thing that you need to consider when you're negotiating your deal is the valuation that they give you, right? So everybody feels, you know, you you can watch Shark Tank and see this. Like everyone thinks they're a one hundred million dollar company just because they have fifty thousand in revenue, right? Um, the higher the valuation that they agree to with you. It basically determines how much of the company they take ownership for, for the amount of money that they're giving you. So it's always a battle over that valuation. So you'll see that on LinkedIn and LinkedIn news articles and posts about, you know, no name security, for example, first unicorn in API security reaches a billion dollar valuation. That doesn't mean that they're bringing in a billion in revenue. It means that they've raised money based on that billion, a billion dollar valuation. Um, but, you know, you have to understand that there's a lot of small print and italics to that. Um, but yeah, I, I, we could like I said, we could we could talk all day about just negotiation alone. Um, so uh, forgive me if I'm no, no, it's good. It's all good information. And yeah. I mean, we'll just I, I'm taking notes here for season two, uh, the Alley Knight episode. You'll be season two episode seven. Every season episode seven will be Alley Knight. You set your watch to it. <laughs> yeah. I love it. I love it. I, I love it too. And hey, everybody, drop in questions in chat. I love it. I am flagging those. We will be asking Ali your questions a little bit later on in the show. Uh, so, Ali, one of the things um, that you said was um, like, you know, different PE firms, different VCs, different angels, whatever. Um, they're interested in different phases of where your business is. How do you like, is it as simple as just going to a website or is there some type of like ultra VC con mixer that you go to and get like a wristband and like, they're like, oh, like this table over here is early funding and this table over here is late stage. Like, wh wh where do you go for these things? Yeah, so that's a great question. So first thing you're going to want to do is find out what what, and I'm glad you brought up angel investors because I I'm, I'd be remiss not to mention them. Angel investors will typically come in in a much smaller amount, so they're usually what are called the UHNWs or high, ultra high net worth individuals, and they'll put in like 100k or 250k, and that can that can mean a lot of money to some startups when you're when you're very early stage so it's it's okay to not immediately go to venture capitalists vcs tend to be a lot more uh, i'm going to offend some vcs who are <laughs> right now but um you know you'll hear them referred to as vulture capitalists 
but oh, that's, that's the that's the reason is because they tend to take a greater greater control of the company or demand a board seat that sort of thing uh, they could demand an observer seat which is okay as well but you know angels tend which is why they're called angel investors right they tend to be a lot less predatory they tend to require less in exchange for their money so you know you could easily start a, a new company and reach out to angel investors instead so that is an option but to answer your question directly jerry you want to first find which investors whether they're vcs or angels invest in cybersecurity companies once you determine and you've created that evernote page of notes and you've got all the list of vcs that invest in cyber then you want to find out which ones are early stage. I'm assuming most of you in the audience are going to be early stage. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So you're going to want to find which ones are early stage because you don't, you have to remember this. This is another thing that very few VCs will tell you. And I learned this the hard way very early on in the nineties when I started my first company. Entrepreneurs will have a tendency to blast their business plan out to random email addresses of VC firms. You have to remember something you're blasting your idea out to VCs who could very easily, and by the way, this has happened, this is a thing, where they'll take a business plan that was submitted to them and they don't want to invest in that person. So what they'll do is they'll take the idea and bring it to another entrepreneur or another company in their portfolio that they trust and give them the idea instead. You have to remember, when you are blasting your business plan out, there is no expectations of non-disclosure mm. so if if you're blasting your business plan out to you know you go you, you go you go to your wife or your husband or your partner and you say i sent out a hundred business plans today yeah but you didn't send out any ndas <laughs> requiring them to not use your idea or steal it this has happened go google it you can google vc funds that have been sued for this but there's nothing that prevents them if you're blasting your business plan out everywhere to take that idea and say, hey, if I'm a VC, I go to Jerry and say, hey, Jerry, I the 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 originator, the founder of this startup and this idea has no track record of success. They've they've not done anything before. I don't trust them, but I trust you. Why don't you take this idea and very easily we'll give you the funding to be able to hire the developers to make this? But here's this idea. Um, it happens. So be very careful of who you send your business plan to. And on top of that, unfortunately, here's the bad news. It's a double-edged sword. A lot of VCs won't sign NDAs. And, and there's a reason for that. It's because it's it's they don't know. It's not because they're trying to be shady or you know uh, just a bad person. They don't know how many companies that their VC fund invests in they may not know every single secret sauce that all of that portfolio of companies has. So if they sign an NDA with you and it turns out that your product idea is very similar to one of their portfolio companies and they don't know that, you can sue them for breach of that NDA claiming that they got the idea from you when in fact it was a portfolio company that pre-existed. So just remember that, okay, you you have to be further along in that conversation in order for you to be able to get them to invest in the idea. Now, here's the thing. You're also cart before the horse if you're blasting your business plan out to everyone. Instead of blasting your business plan out to everyone, create a one sheet. Yep. Now, a one sheet is basically taking your entire pitch deck, and we can talk about that as well, but your entire pitch deck and then creating a crib sheet so to speak, one sheet that explains, uh, be, this is harder than it sounds, but a few sentences of your company, a few sentences of your technology, and a few sentences of your, your use of proceeds, a few sentences of your customers or your market, and that's it. That's it. And then just send that out to everyone. And it sounds easy, but it's, it's really difficult to do that because a lot of people can tell me what their company or product does in 30 to 45 minutes. But how many people do you think can tell me what their product or company is in 30 seconds? Right. And I've had a lot of startups who can't do that. 
And until you can explain what your company and what your product does to me in 30 seconds, you do not go out there and try and raise money because it means you don't know what your own company does. Yeah. Eric, you can't articulate it in a short amount of time. And the value of it, right? You almost have to step out of your own skin and say, all right, if I'm on the receiving end of this, can they understand it fast enough? And can they see the value the way you as sort of the inventor or the entrepreneur sees it, right? Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. You need to be able to explain that value proposition in a very short period of time. And without all of the marketing terminology, like <laughs> we're an artificial intelligent machine <laughs> Yeah. supervised and unsupervised learning models that does autonomous response to zero detox. It's like, what the hell did you just say? Yeah. Um, you go to chat GPT and just have it vomit. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, yeah. That is not going to work. It's <laughs> marketing case. vomit. And you just, Hey, look, we detect, we, we detect attacks without intrusion detection system signatures, mm -hmm. or, you know, we, we communicate with your firewall to quickly block attacks within a few seconds of detection. Yeah. You, you don't stop trying to sound like an engineer, stop trying to sound smart, stop trying to sound like you know everything by impressing them with your big words. Just explain what the heck it does. And it, it, it really, you look at the websites over, like I started in you know the early 90s, right before there were YouTube influencers and before all of this, Cybersecurity product companies have really changed and evolved over time where initially it was all about how smart you can sound and, and how, you know, AI you can sound to really websites today. If you notice the technical marketing, the copy, the technical copy is, is basically in lay terms. It's mm -hmm. very underwhelming. It's very not flashy. It's not, it's not over engineered. It's very simply this is what we do this is what we block this is how you know we can help make your life easier stop trying to sound smart in your website in your product material in your literature it's just about what the heck does the product do yeah what's the value proposition period yeah. what like yeah. why do i care <laughs> why do i care the, you, you everyone you all have to understand like it, the, zoomer zoomers gen zers uh, have entered the workforce. They're becoming, you know, decision makers. And, you know, the, it's the TikTok generation. We have zero attention span now. And you need to be able to explain to someone, like, have you ever had a, a friend of the family or someone come in, like, hey, come in and watch this amazing new Netflix series that you've got to check out and you're going to binge watch it. And you sit them down and try and get them to watch the pilot. But while they're watching the pilot, they're on their cell phone right? No one has attention span anymore. So you need to be able to explain what the hell you do in, in a few seconds, or don't even talk to anyone until you can do that. Yeah, 100%. I got, so one thing that you're talking about, I think would be really helpful for people to hear is sort of pitfalls to avoid when talking to VCs, right? Or those and, and one of them that I'm hearing you say, which is kind of interesting is like, you know, don't try to do their job for them. Like, don't try to tell them how smart you are. Don't try to tell them all these things. Don't try to tell them, you know, the things that might be in their area. Because what we've heard a lot of is like, oh, this is going to be worth a billion dollars. This is going to be worth, you know, it's a unicorn. Dollar. And when when the person who's invented it says that, uh, my suspicion is, and, you know, there's some tales of this, that, you know, immediately the VCs turn off. So maybe don't try to do their job. But there are, are there other things. One, does that resonate? And two, like, are there other things you should just absolutely avoid you know, when talking to somebody when you're going for funding? Yeah. So look, here's the thing. Um, I, I feel like the technical prowess of VCs and just investors in general, especially in the cybersecurity space, they're smarter than you think. All right. Uh, you'll, you'll get told, oh, you know, they're bankers. So they only really understand numbers. They don't even know what an IP address is. Uh, I, I feel like I, and some people may key my car for saying this, but I feel like those days are gone. The, the, and the, the, the VC today in cybersecurity knows a hell of a lot more than you give them credit for. Um, there are definitely investors out there who don't know what an IP address is, but they tend to, if, if they don't understand the difference between AI and ML, they will bring someone into the room, into the conversation. That's probably part of their portfolio already to help them 
determine whether or not what you have is something viable or what's called an accretive investment. And so I think the, the first answer to your question, Ryan, is don't make the mistake of thinking the person that you're talking to is a complete idiot because they can they can chew right through a lot of the BS that you think you're going to snow them over with. So don't underestimate the VC you're talking to. Secondly, be very careful of saying that we have zero false positives. I, I feel like that's the biggest mistake that you can make as an entrepreneur is we've figured out how to have zero false positives or we've eliminated all the noise, right? We, we, we find the signal and the noise and we've completely eliminated the noise. That's just not going to happen. And VCs understand that and know that. And so I think if you avoid a lot of that cliche kind of marketing spiel that you typically see on booths at RSA or black hat briefings, you're, you're going to be okay. It, it just don't make glamorous statements like we, we've figured out how to eliminate false positives because most VCs will know that that's total BS. The other thing is, I think, just making sure that you understand who you're talking to, meaning that you've actually researched the VC. They'll appreciate that if, if you if you know sort of who's in their portfolio. Like, for example, if, if you know that they've invested in Arctic Wolf, for example, you can say, hey, look, you know, our technology will actually plug right into the Arctic Wolf platform and that way it's it's even more creative to you because you can leverage existing portfolio technology to expand our our initially be able to immediately start seeing revenue growth uh, as part of that investment you open up your portfolio companies to us and we have an audience to be able to sell to or integrate with so i think having done that homework a lot of people sort of expect you to not know who the hell they are so the the i think the the it's very arrogant if you walk into a meeting that you were able to actually get with a VC or investor and not know who they are. And there's so much data available to you now on LinkedIn on who they are and who they've invested in that it's almost a shame if you walk into a meeting with a VC and you haven't taken the time to at least look at their LinkedIn profile. If you if you know more about them before you go into a meeting with them, you'll you'll gain some brownie points with them on the fact that you took the time out to research who they are. Yeah, if you're really that smart, you'll do the homework. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and I demonstrate that to them. It's it's just this immediate gratification age that we're in right now, where you want to get the most amount of return with the least amount of work uh, to do it. And I, I think it, it creates an atmosphere also for those who do take the time out to do the homework on who they're talking to, to be able to say and to be able to stick out from from the crowd and say, "Hey, look, I I." and cared about this meeting enough to take the time out to research who you are, who you've invested in, and who's in your current portfolio, and how we might fit into that. It'll also give you an opportunity to find out if they've already invested in a competitor. Don't waste your time submitting and trying to reach out to a VC who's invested in one of your competitors. They will not invest in you if they've invested in your competitor. Think about it for a second. Why, why would they? If they've put all this money into one of your competitors, they would have no interest in talking to you. So if you send them sensitive data and sensitive material, you've just shot yourself in the foot because it's very possible that that might make it your competitor. So, you know, be very careful about who you talk to and, and that research process will tell you whether or not you should even be reaching out to that investor. A lot of cautionary tales and lessons learned from Ali Knight regarding going after funding. When we come back from the break, Ali's going to be answering your questions. I've got them all queued up. There's a lot of great ones in here, and I've got a couple myself that I would love to hear the answers to. All that and more when we come back. You chose a career in cybersecurity, and you follow this podcast because you're passionate about being at the top of your field. But let's face it, not all training is created equal. Don't settle for boring training that leaves you uninspired. You deserve the best to support your dreams. At ACI Learning, our instructors are legends in the field. Our studios are state of the art. We're always on so that you can be too. We're equipped to pivot and cover every emerging trend in cybersecurity. Because in this fast paced industry, you need training that keeps up. But it's not just about the expertise. Our on demand video training is designed to be actually fun to watch. We believe learning should be exciting, not a chore. 
We offer training in every major vendor and certification. ACI Learning is on it, so you can be too. And don't just take our word for it. See what others are saying on Trustpilot. Real reviews from real professionals who have experienced our offerings firsthand. Choose ACI Learning because support for your cybersecurity career deserves nothing but the best. Welcome back, everybody. We're talking with Allie Knight about funding your startup. She's co-founder at Knight Group, which owns a whole portfolio of businesses, and she's got very, very deep experience and knowledge to share. It's been it's been awesome so far, Allie. A couple questions coming from chat. Jeff Spear wanted to know regarding um, growth. What, what's in a better investment? Do you go after salespeople or ops people? I think is what he means. Like, do you build the sales team up or do you build the ops team up uh, for better investment? That's a great, great question. So, you know, one of the things that you as the CEO or founder of the company really need to focus on is revenue. It doesn't matter whether you bring in funding or not. As a matter of fact, when you bring in investor investment and investors, you, it's almost like you have to double down even more on revenue because they, they don't want to see any sort of uh, degradation in performance, if you will, on, on revenue growth after funding comes in because, you know, founders have a tendency to get complacent and when that funding comes in, go on their long awaited vacation, probably much deserved, but still, and then really just kind of be in this vacation mindset now that they have 40 million or, you know, 2 million in the bank. So I think, you know, the answer to your question is definitely always focus on revenue, always focus on sales. Uh, cash is king and the, you know, the more revenue that you're bringing in, and it also depends on the stage of your company. If you haven't brought in funding yet, then definitely focus on sales. When I've grown my previous companies, I always focused on sales first. And, you know, it, for me, yeah, operations is important. Obviously it depends on the company that you're talking about, whether you need developers to build that product or SOC analysts to, to analyze events. You need to self, you need to be able to sell. Otherwise those people on the back end don't have any work to work on. Or, you know, you don't want to be, I, I, I hate to use this, this cliche, but you know, ABC, always be closing. You have to mm -hmm. always be closing deals, always have things in the pipeline, always have things in the funnel. And um, I, I feel like no matter what stage of company you're at, that needs to be your primary focus is hi hiring beaters. I would, uh, for those of you who actually still read books today, um, I would recommend a book called The Inside Sales Playbook. It's, it's probably the best sales book I have ever read. It provides a no-nonsense, methodical approach to building out an inside sales team and figuring out, hey, how do I onboard salespeople and what do I what do I put them on immediately from day one to day ninety? And so, and she actually went on to start her own company, the author. So, I I, I would definitely recommend reading that book for those of you who are interested in figuring out how to actually staff up and recruit a sales team and the difference between an ISR and a BDR, like an inside sales rep and a business development rep. So I think the long winded answer to your question, which is a great question is focus on sales. Yeah. And you know, I, I'm going to go around the horn on this one because the question was sales versus ops. And it's, you know, it, it's a really great question, Jeff, because it's a very simply put question, but it's very, very nuanced and complicated. The one thing I would say is ops is good, but again, I have like a one person business. It's much smaller than the things that Ali and Ryan have accomplished. But if, if you spend all your time, energy, and effort building something and you hire operations people and you haven't vetted that anyone wants to buy it, you could you could find out a really, really expensive, difficult lesson down the road. So, and, and one other thing I've seen too is like, hey, Ali, I, I know how to, I'm going to create this product that makes you, you know, makes horses fly. It's amazing. It zero detection, uh, zero false positives and horses can fly. Do you want to buy it? And Ali's like, hell yeah, that sounds awesome. And then you, you go off and make it and she's like, actually, I don't really want to buy it. Have someone commit to like, hey, you know what? If you really like it, I'll give you 50% off. We're going to sell it for $10,000. Give me 5,000 right now and you'll be the first customer. And they're like, yeah. You know? Yeah. You know what? Hollywood is a great example of this. Uh, and, and you can actually learn a lot from how, how Hollywood works. They will never release a movie out until they've done a market a market test, on, especially before they go to final cut, you know, to, to be able to 
get the movie out. There's always a market test done. You want to do a market test just because you think it's the coolest thing next to sliced bread, just because you think it's it, it'll solve the world's problems doesn't necessarily mean there's a market for it. It doesn't necessarily mean that people are ready to buy it. You might be ahead of the market, right? So, you know, there's a lot of people who argued that, that Elon Musk was well ahead of the EV market almost too early. Um, what, you know, when he came out with the Tesla, the world wasn't ready. The infrastructure wasn't there. Uh, a lot of that has obviously since changed. But you need to remember that just because you think it's it's the coolest thing in the world, that's great. Maybe you built it for yourself, but there may not be a mass market for it. And that's one of good. That's going to be one of the most important questions the VCs are going to want to know: is is there a market for this? Yes, this sounds cool. That's amazing that you built it. And you know, it's it's Skynet. It's it's Skynet. But does anyone want this? And will they pay money for it? Here's another big thing, and and I'm glad you brought this up, Jerry. Is a lot of people don't realize that. And I've seen companies do this. You've seen companies pivot. Elusive was a great example of this. So you'll build a product and you won't realize you're selling it as your flagship product, but you don't realize that it's not actually a, a product in of itself that people will buy. It's a feature of a product. You've built a feature. It, it, it's it's the funniest thing. So, and, and a lot of people don't see this coming. You know, it's this amazing widget, but you don't realize that, oh my God, I, I haven't built a standalone product that people want to implement in their infrastructure. It's a feature of another product that I've built. That makes you a great M&A target from all your competitors, but you have to get a significant amount of, of customers and, and, and runway before you're going to be of any interest to a competitor to buy you, to add on as a feature of their product. But if you look at the acquisition of Elusive, if you look at the acquisitions in recent times, a lot of those products were just turned into features of existing products. And, and so you need to ask yourself that too, is, is this a standalone product that can stand on its own that people would implement into their stack? Or is this just a feature I've built that another product can quickly add to their product? And that's part of the return that the investors look for, right? So it's like, what is that addressable market? Are right. you meeting it? And there's a lot that goes into that, right? What are you meeting it? And then how do you sustain it over time? Right. Yeah. And that, that's really where, you know, Jerry mentioned and Al, you mentioned value earlier. That's really where the value is. Like, can you scale it without a competitor coming and eating your lunch? You know, at the end of the day, at an addressable market that actually is is being addressed, right? There's a lot of complicating factors in there, but I love that. That's like that. That's that's at the end of the day. You might think it's a great product, but unless somebody's going to buy it and it's going to scale, uh, and until that starts happening, you really don't know what the product is yet until the market actually you know speaks. Exactly. Yeah. So I mean, the, what we're talking about here is very interesting because you may not know that your product is you know a product or a feature. You may not know if it's going to sell or not. You don't know if you're targeted as an acquisition target or not. Uh, De Deidre uh, actually has a great question. I'd love your thoughts. Like, so you start, you start your business, right? Are you starting a business alley and saying like, okay, hey, here's my business plan. The goal is to sell us uh, from, from Jump Street. Or do you make the decision to sell naturally because you're like, oh, you know, it's two years. I'm bored with this company. It's successful. Or this is the peak time in the market to sell it. If we're going to sell it, it's got the highest value, like a like a, a an athlete in their prime about to go off the off the cliff. So what what are your what are your thoughts around this? Like you've you've got the funding, or maybe you're using this to get funding. Do, are you are you projecting that you're selling it now, or are you going organically? So uh, first of all, hi, Deidre. It's a good question. I agree. Um, that's a good question. Here's the thing. One of the questions, one of the standard issue questions that a VC will ask you during your pitch is what is your exit strategy? Not the billion dollar question that they want to know. Not a, it's, I'm almost actually hearing that question get asked less and less now, because it's just not that important, especially when you're talking about super early stage funding, like an A round or a seed round. So I think it's probably, the answer to your question, Deidre, is it's probably too early to think about something like that when you're starting a business. It, yeah, it's important, but at the end of the day, it really doesn't matter uh, whether you're planning on go, your seed round or A round, whether you're planning on exiting through uh, going IPO or being acquired by another company. It, the, the number one thing that you should be focusing on at an early stage of, of starting the business is 
is their market and how do I sell it to them? How do I get it in front of them? Because the, there's sales teams are going through an even bigger uh, fundamental shift uh, with the pandemic of everyone working from home and people no longer having desk phones that they could rely on uh, into an office building and having to figure out you know, people's cell phone numbers, uh, leads databases that you pay for access to had to re really change their models as well. Uh, because of this. It's really difficult to reach, to find and reach out to potential buyers. And now it's, if you notice your LinkedIn inbox is full of spam now, it's because a lot of the salespeople just don't know how to find you and get to you because you know, the workforce is working from home. So the only idea that they can think of is reaching out to them on social media. Before it used to be very, you know, off-putting and, and, and off-limits. Uh, for salespeople to reach out to you on Facebook because that's where your family pictures are. That's where that's more personal. I'm even getting salespeople reach out to me on Facebook. So I, it's 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 the world has changed. And so instead of thinking about you know, hey, do I want to go IPO, which is an incredibly expensive endeavor, by the way, um, or do, do I want to um, be acquired? I feel like that's a question that you need to ask way later on. Uh, it's it's not an early stage question. I'm curious what a, what a good answer to that would be, just sort of reflecting on that, right? Because we know what bad looks like, right? Um, when VCs are you know looking at us like, oh, okay, hey, this is what I want to do. I want to sell it for a billion dollars and I'll leave without any real fundamentals underneath it. But what might like a good answer to that be when faced with the person that you're asking for money for, right? Who's who's going to be wildly interested in, in that answer? You know what I'm I, saying? I feel like yeah, I feel like VCs tend to also ask questions they already know the answer to. Right. Um, yeah. You know, it's typically a rhetorical question, meaning that mm -hmm. if the VC is actually genuinely interested in investing in you, they probably already know a good uh, you know acquisition target. They might even be a portfolio company. Uh, yeah. where, you know, they already know who they would sell to. And you have to remember VCs, uh, the most important thing about a VC is their connections and their network and who they have access to to bring uh, business ideas to or products to and immediately begin monetizing their investment. So they probably already know who, the, who you know, what a good exit for the company might be. And they're probably just testing you to see if it's completely wild and, or if it's in alignment with what they're thinking. Uh, I, I don't think that there's really a wrong answer to this question. There's, you know, they may think you're good at m and but you're like, I want to go public. Okay, so do I, but you don't have a single customer yet. You know, so I mean, it's, I, I don't know. I feel like there's no wrong answer to that question. <laughs> uh, just like in real time here, uh, you did mention IPO being a, incredibly expensive. Uh, BSEC uh, dropped in and said, uh, made a joke about the dot-com era since uh, all of us here uh, are older and, and lived through that. Um, he wanted to know, are you seeing, are you seeing IPOs happening or, cause he made, he has the assumption that it's a lot of M and A. What, what, what kind of, what, a, what's the ecosystem from your perspective, since you're in these meetings and on boards and such? Yeah, sure. So, uh, I am actually seeing quite a bit of IPOs. Now, a, a lot of the times you'll see them go onto what are called the pink sheets or over the counter OTC pink sheets. You'll typically also hear these referred to as penny stocks. So, the the filing requirements for OTC companies and this really exploded with the whole Reddit investment craze where people were pump what are called pump and dump or pumping stocks on Reddit to get people a bunch of people to buy it and then they dump it once they once it's pumped up it's called pump and dump scams but that tends to happen with penny stock companies because the filing requirements are are really not what they are on the you know uh, the New York Stock Exchange or Nasdaq. But the answer to your question is yes, IPOs, but more on the pink sheet side. Now you you do have the ability to take your your startup to the pink sheets or to the OTC and be publicly traded where the general market, the the you know um, what are called retail investors can invest in you. However, be careful with that because I, I, we dealt with this recently with um, a startup that I'm in uh, on the board for where they went, they went public um, on the OTC and, and VCs don't want to touch it because it's, 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 a, it's an unusual model for them and they don't know how to navigate that or they don't want to navigate that. 
Um, you know, so if you decide to go into the OTC and sell stock in your company, understand that you're pro you're you're going to have difficulty or challenges. I'm not saying it's impossible, but you're going to have challenges later trying to raise money for your company um, with VCs that are not that it's not very traditional of an investment for them. Yeah, hundred percent. So what, as far as like, okay, so what I'm hearing is it's definitely better to find individual investors, VCs, angels. Um, yeah. PE well, I got more individuals. Yeah. Yeah. So, so I know earlier, I, and I want to take this back uh, a minute because you said something that like, I'm super excited about, but I'm super confused about. So you, you mentioned like, don't send your business plan smart. Uh, have like a one pager that's kind of like, here's the value prop, here's the deal and all that and send that out. But my, my question is, Alyssa, like, do people, is it like, is there like a dating website where you, you find like single VCs looking to mingle? Like, like I'm being, I'm being playful. Yeah, but like, do you scan people's, yeah, like, is there yeah, a yeah. So, so there, there are like, dare I say social media sites for startups looking for funding. So uh, a very popular one is called AngelList. That okay. I want to say AngelList.co, but just Google it. It's called AngelList. And they'll it, they'll actually walk you through creating your one pager. And it'll generate a one pager for you on your company, product, market, value proposition. And investors who are on that website will be looking for, you know, these sort of micro investments where you're look, you know, you have a minimum set, you, know, you can set a minimum of 50 K and a high net worth individual looking for tax write-offs or whatever, will go in there and start deploying money into these companies uh, that they want to invest in. So angel list is a, is a good example of that, and you can find alternative sites to angel list, but angel list is one of the big ones. I was actually quite involved with that site very early on. The other thing that I want to bring up, and we haven't talked about this yet. Again, like this can be a very, this, this, this live stream could go all day. Oh no, I love it. I love it. It's just uh, like chat chats, like uh, uh busting my chops about how, like I I'm the one asking like for like, where do I, where do I find these investors alley? Like I'm just secretly like mining. <laughs> it's more of a selfish kind of interview. No, I, I love those. I love it. Yeah. All of you need to remember equity investment is not the only option. You can also do what what's called debentures or, you know, convertible debt, right? What convertible debt is, is your investment, you know, that the, the equity that they're investing in can actually convert over um, or, or vice versa. So initially it's debt that you owe, that you owe back, right? With interest. And then if, if that doesn't, um, if you don't pay that money back, they have the option to convert that into equity. So let me talk about that for a minute. So convertible debt, there, there's an advantage to that. And all of you can go Google this, but there's a, there's an advantage to convertible debt. What do you think that is for, for those of you, instead of, if you're not selling equity in your business and you're selling convertible net debt or what are called notes, convertible notes in your company, what what's the advantage of that? The advantage is you're not setting a valuation at such an early stage. So if let's say for example, uh, Mel and I, you know, we want to deploy some money uh, because taxes are coming up, and we need to quickly uh, for tax reasons, we'll quickly deploy like a hundred k. I could I could go to Jerry and say, Hey Jerry, we'll give you a hundred k in in exchange instead of an equity in your company, we'll do it for convertible notes. So, you know, you, you, there's an, you know, you create this MOU or memorandum of understanding what this means. And you get, for example, coupons at a, like a 10% coupon or a 20% coupon. Again, we, this, this would be a whole show. I don't want to go into too much depth on this, but basically instead of selling equity in the business, you're selling kind of like IOUs, if you think about it. And so those have a maturity date. So I owe you this amount by this maturity date. And um, if instead of paying it back, you, you also have the option to convert that into equity at a later time. By not setting your valuation that early on in the company and raising money, it, it allows you to kind of sidestep that, that problem where you've set a valuation too early in the company that you have to stick to with later investors. So what would happen is, let's say Jerry came to me and I gave him a hundred thousand in equity and I set his valuation at 10 million. 
what happens when he wants to bring in VCs later and the VCs come and say, oh, 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 wait a minute, wait a minute. We don't have to negotiate a valuation. You've already said a valuation with Alyssa at $10 million. So we're going to go off that valuation. You know, um, but you're saying, like, no, 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 we're, 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 we're $50 million valuation. We're a hundred million dollar valuation. Ignore that. Well, no, but this was something that you agreed on and said you were worth at that time. And that was always six months ago. We're, we're using that as a starting point. Ooh, brutal. You brutal. You shot yourself in the foot. Now, instead of that hundred million dollar valuation, they're setting your valuation at 10 million because you were really desperate for that money for me. And this is Sequoia Capital or whomever, and they're saying, no, 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 you know, we're, we want 51% of your company because we're going to go up that $10 million valuation instead. So, you know, it's you, you have to be really careful with your valuations and what you said. Those convertible notes um, are a great way to kind of get around that because you're so early of a company. If you don't have customers, all you have is an idea. Um, or you have a product and no customers and all you have is this idea. It's, it's, it's so early. How does anyone really know what your valuation is? Well, uh, wait a minute. Um, Polo Alto Networks is valued at, you know, a hundred billion dollars and we think we can take 10% of their market. So that means we're a $10 billion company. No one's going to buy that. No <laughs> buy that. You know, they're yeah. Polo Alto Networks, you know? That sounds like, like you said earlier about how Shark Tank, when that, when they come in and like they have their own valuation and then yeah, they always, they always, yeah. play. we're like, you know, <laughs> we've sold it to five of our neighbors on the block and they're like, we're a $10 million. Yeah. Company. Yeah. You know, and they made 50,000 that year. And, you know, so, you know, Mr. Nice Guy and whatever, they're trying to figure out, like, it doesn't compute. Like, yeah. you made 50000 in revenue and you're claiming you're, you know, a $50 million company. It doesn't compute. So, you know, you can sidestep a lot of those value early, very premature valuation questions by just raising convertible debt. Now, you here, here, here's the thing. There's a lot of investors that don't want to touch convertible debt. So you need to remember because there's different tax implications. There's different ways that convertible debt is treated for an investor uh, than equity. And you also have funds that the, 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 you know, these different LPs, these different funds that they've started, there's rules around what they can invest in and non in that these hedge funds and these endowments and stuff like that have given them money to deploy where they can't use that for convertible debt. They have to use that for um, uh, what's called uh, uh, equity for equity. So you need to remember like there's different investment perspectives, different types of investors. There's convertible debt investors that would be glad to take a convertible notes uh, or there's equity investors and a majority of them, unfortunately, are equity investors. Yeah, no surprise. It's not as simple as like, hi, simple. just hand me money and it's there's, there you go. There's a lot of idiosyncratic nuances to that, that we can go down. And, you know, there's there's a lot of term sheets that we can discuss and uh, different ratchet clauses that we can discuss. This is a very complicated topic, but here's my advice. Keep it simple. You know, go get Kaios, Guy Kawasaki's book, The Art of the Start. Uh, he gives, he's one of the most famous VC investors um, of all time. And he created a blog article on the perfect pitch deck. It's like five or six slides. And I've seen pitch decks with 50 slides. I'm like, what the hell are you doing? Um, five, six slides at the most. Explains your company, explains your product. The guy's name is Guy Kawasaki. And he, he, he created a blog post that basically summarizes his book. I think there's even a newer version of Art of the Start. Um, but go grab that book if you're into reading uh, or watch, read the, the blog. Um, so he, that's my recommendation. Create your pitch deck. Figure out what kind of, you know, how much money do you want to raise? There is it is right there, yeah. Right? So there's a big, yep, that's it, 10 slides. Uh, very simple. The simple 10-slide pitch deck. And... You know, also making sure with your pitch deck, it's not paragraphs of text. It, you know, very short to the point bullet points in size 18 or 20 font or whatever it is. But create your pitch deck, know what you do, be able to explain it in 15 seconds and 
know what how much money you want to raise and what you're going to use it for. That's another thing, use of proceeds. All of you need to know what you're going to use that money for. If I if I came to you and Ryan and said, hey, Jerry, Ryan, I'm going to give you 100K, you need to be able to tell me what you're going to use that money for. And if it's, yeah. well, I can finally pay myself a salary. Yeah. No, but, and that's the other thing you need to remember is that VCs also want you to use that money. You don't, the answer can't be, we're going to put it in a high yield savings account. Yeah, yeah. Invest it in mm -hmm. Bitcoin and we're going to turn it into 10 times that with crypto. It's, it's no, yeah, you need, they, VCs, uh, investors are going to want you to spend that money and they're going to want you to spend it on sales. Talking about well, we're going to get a huge floor in the Empire State Building in New York because office space is so cheap now. It, they, they don't want to hear that. They're going to want to hear that you're going to spend it on revenue generating uh, costs, like expanding your sales force, uh, hiring that, that data scientist so you can finally get your ML models working. What are, they, they want to make sure it's going towards some sort of revenue generation and the watch it right like that's part of the the stages as you're moving up as you're saying sort of the metrics going gonna watch it. yeah i yeah. mean the, you know obviously <laughs> yeah. so if you, if you roll in with a car that just yeah yeah after a documentary don't lie to your vcs if you if, yeah. you, if you're always tell the truth to your investors do not go down that path of of lying to your misrepresenting. I've seen that. I've seen that. I've had to go back to CEOs and say, well, you know, this slide here is not exactly the truth. Yeah. You do not want to lie to your board. You don't want to lie to your VC. Definitely not. Yeah. Definitely not. Uh, so Alyssa, before we wrap up, I, you know, I know you're working on a thousand projects, always doing amazing things. Uh, what are some things coming up that people who are, are enjoying listening to you and enjoying your projects uh, can connect with you and, and see the work you're doing. Yeah, yeah, we're we're working on a new HBO series, which we're really excited about. We're working on your new, uh, your season one of your new show, uh, the new late night talk show we're playing. Uh, so definitely reach out to me on LinkedIn. You can reach out, I'm also, I'm on Instagram. You can follow me on, and subscribe to me on Instagram and reach out to me, DM me there. I tend to get a lot of spam in my LinkedIn. I find like I'm, I find that I'm on Instagram more than any other social media platform these days. So you definitely, if you need to DM me, I would say hit me up on Instagram and, you know, check out everything happening at night TV plus we're going to be announcing a subscription cuts. So we're going to be slashing uh, the subscription costs on night TV plus, which is our, our TV network that we own at night studios and where you'll be able to find the first season of Jerry's new upcoming show. Uh, and all of the Night Studios originals are streaming on there as well. So for those of you who are interested in cyber genre entertainment, like Mr. Robot, that sort of thing, check out a subscription to Night TV Plus. It's available on Apple TV, Roku, uh, all of the major OTT streaming platforms. So you can find us there. I love it. I'll drop a link in chat to everybody so you can grab that uh, in a hot second here. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, we've been talking with uh, Ali Knight, co-founder of Knight Group, and just an uh, do, an unbelievable wealth of information. Uh, look for her on uh, nighttvplus.com, but also on season two, episode seven of Cyber Starters, uh, where she'll be coming back. <laughs> coming back, uh, dates to be determined. Ali, thank you so much for sharing so much knowledge with us today. Yeah, I love you and Ryan both. Thank you so much for having me. Thank Absolutely, you, great to have you here. Ryan, you want to do our final thoughts, bud? Yeah, there's a lot. All right, let's do it. Hold on. <laughs>Hey, Ryan. So what were your final thoughts with Allie today? Oh, my gosh. I mean, for those that were following along the whole time, there's just tons of information dripping out of there. So like, I, like go back and listen to this one. Um, to get it down to three is tough. I would say, so my three takeaways here is like the, the one thing that really stood out in the beginning was like investors look for returns. So like this is the funding episode, right? So like when you're going for funding, like think about the return that they're going to get, not the money you're going to get, but the return they're going to get on their investment. I, I thought she teased that out quite nicely with a lot of really good examples. I would say the other one was uh, that she, she harped on a lot and really could sink home for a lot of listeners, like do your homework and don't just show up and think that somebody's going to hand you cash, right? Like do your homework, know the investors, know the space, know what you could get out of it. 
Um, and a win looks like, you know, you show up and then you know how they help. A, lo a loss would be, and I love the way she kind of put this, like cannibal cannibalization of one of her, one of their investments. This is like they are actually invested in a competitor of yours and you're just going to cannibalize their sales, which means they get less of a return. You roll in with that point, with, with not knowing that you could be in deep trouble. Uh, and the last thing uh, was sort of the main key point was uh, everything after the investment is revenue growth right? How are you growing revenue? So there's so much more impact in there, but I think if I were going to boil it down to three, that would, that'd be my three. Yeah. Those are all great points. I mean, it's, it's really hard. She basically gave us, she like backed a dump truck of value up and just <laughs> opened it up on us. Uh, the one thing that I took away, um, besides, um, a soft commit for hundred K into my <laughs> business, <laughs> it, no, the one thing that I took away, and again, I'm, I'm always learning, uh, I'm, I'm a lifelong learner is that different VCs will invest at different points of a stage. So like she mentioned Sequoia Capital a couple of times, like you wouldn't go to Sequoia Capital for like your initial seed funding. Like they're, they're a later stage, more mature. Like in my world, like all the VCs are the same or all the angel investors are the same. Like they're all just like, you know, they hop on board if they believe in your product and they fund you along the way. And that's, that's simply not the case. Uh, so uh, really, I guess, peeling back the onion, if you will, and understanding more of the complexity, more of the nuance of what the investment side of the house and the funding side of the house looks like mm -hmm. um, was really my key takeaway. Yeah, that's a good one. I mean, th this is such an important topic with so much information. And I love the fact that she has such a valuable set of information, too. Like everything she was bringing out is like, oh, yeah, we could go deep dive on each one of those. So, yeah, yeah great, great episode. Great guest. Ali's just phenomenal. Yeah, and I'm gonna drop a link in chat to Night TV Plus, so everybody go check that out. Um, so great show. Uh, this was season one, episode seven of Cyber Starters, funding your startup with Allie Knight from Knight Group. On behalf of Ryan Lervik, I'm Jerry Ozier. I hope you all had a great time. Thanks so much. And until next time, stay secure. See you then. Thank you from that amazing interview. Be sure to check the entire back catalog of Cyber Starters interviews for more tips on launching and the effective business operations for cybersecurity entrepreneurs. You won't want to miss our next episode, I guarantee it. Join the Simply Cyber Discord server at simplycyber.io slash discord to chat with the larger community and be made aware when we go live. We want all your questions answered. Until next time, I'm Jerry for Cyber